You miss more by not looking than by not knowing. Hey, Horse World. Today, we're diving into the fascinating world of holistic veterinary science with Dr. Connie Fancy. Connie is a pelvic exam specialist who's on the forefront of collaborative horse care, specific to internal misalignments and injuries that affect horse performance. Dr. Fancy is all about uncovering the hidden reasons behind your horse's compromised performance or physical discomfort, from kidney immobility to kissing spine to flipped ovaries to long forgotten gelding scars. Using my own horses as case studies, Dr. Fancy will reveal what's really going on beneath the surface and how you can spot it in your own horse. If you've ever struggled with unexplained performance issues with your horse, but no one could diagnose the real culprit, or you were told to order up a full round of injections by your local vet, then this episode is for you. Plus, Dr. Fancy shares hands-on tips you can start using right away. A quick heads up, there's some medical talk involving ultrasounds, so please be mindful that some listeners may find this episode explicit. With that warning, please enjoy this information-packed conversation with insights that could immediately transform how you care for your horse. Dear Horse World, it's Dr. Connie Fancy. Connie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I am really excited about this podcast because we have kind of fallen upon each other. I was introduced to your work um, while I've been here in Alberta, and I've been kind of blown away. So I'd love for you to kind of tell our listeners a little bit about what you do. All right. Well, I've been a vet for 29 years and um, have uh, always had an interest in horses. Very early in my career, um, I realized that there was something missing in veterinary medicine. We're very good at pharmacology and surgery, mm. but um, there are aspects of the um, the horse that veterinarians don't have a good grasp on. Um, and so we need to be able to work as a team with other disciplines. And um, early on in my career, that, that was maybe a little bit difficult because um, of my location where I'm at in Southern Alberta um, and just really not knowing what it was that I needed um, to help horses in certain situations that um, I was not able to help with either uh, for lameness injections or um, medications. I felt like I was medicating issues that maybe could be helped with um, some sort of other discipline maybe acupuncture, maybe massage therapy, I didn't know. Mm. Um, and so at that time, I watched a present, well, it was not a presentation, it was more um, a, a weekend of a work done by uh, Yannick, who is a an osteopath, mm -hmm. and also is the instructor for the Vlugen Institute that was at the time in Texas, in Germany, um, and now is in Florida. Cool. And I remember uh, being there as a relatively new grad and thinking, yeah, that's actually, I think, part of what I'm missing um, mm -hmm. is the whole horse approach and um, being able to help the horse in terms of the, the nervous system, the lymphatics, the circulation. Um, and working with somebody that that can um, augment what I do. And mm. at the time, there was nobody that uh, did that in Alberta. So he went back to his school in Texas, and I went back to my practice and um, and did what I did, a reproduction lameness. That was always my passion. Um, and then fast forward years later, and... Uh, I met um, Jessica Van Buskirk, who is uh, an osteopath and a graduate from the Vlugen Institute, and finally got to really understand what it was that osteopathy was all about and how that can help um, what I do as a veterinarian. And mm. um, from there, it it kind of took off. We started working together on cases, um, ones that I especially lamenesses that were long term. Maybe I was a third or fourth vet um, after referral practices, injections, um, some MRIs that it, it just obscure lamenesses, um, asymmetries, things like that. And, uh, and we worked together on these cases. And uh, I got to realize that there's a lot 
of internal issues with horses that are manifested externally. Fascinating. So when you say, and you say your two passions are reproduction and lameness. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And so how did that kind of come about? Like how, what about osteopathy kind of resonated with you as a veterinarian? So on the reproduction part of it, there were always mares that um, were problem mares, the ones that didn't conceive, haven't conceived for years, um, despite uh, f um, doing cultures of the uterus, flushing mm. the uterus, doing all the medical and pharmacological things that I knew what to do with. Um, and it, and it seemed what really actually um, interested me is that when some of these mares that I ultrasounded, the ovaries were um, not where they were supposed to be, so to speak. They were they were not in line. They were not in line with the uterus, and then um, just on on palpation, so rectally going in and feeling these ovaries, they those ones were tight, and mm -hmm. so getting to know the field of osteopathy more through Jess, mm -hmm. that um, I, I, I got to learn that that actually is a displacement of the, of the ovary. And so externally, um, osteopathy, there are indicators through the musculoskeletal system mm -hmm. that uh, an osteopath does evaluations on. And um, it was really interesting to me how Jessica would de do these evaluations and then um, call me or if she was there beside me, tell me, hey, you should look at this left ovary because um, I'm getting an indication externally that this left ovary is displaced or immobile. And sure enough, when I've sedated the horse, the horse is relaxed. I go and feel this ovary is actually displaced or immobile. And so from there, I had a, a bunch of oh my goodness aha moments where hey this is actually working this is actually real and um not only that in those early cases um the immobility was something that i could fix so mm -hmm. internally um moving this ovary back to its normal position and then these mares go on to conceive. So mm. we had a, a happy end moment. Um, yeah. It was success, and it uh, and it was because of those osteopathic indicators. Okay, so for everyone who's listening, you heard Connie say that right, that she's palpating, r like, manually. Mm-hmm. And rect is that even a word? Rectally, Rectally right? Okay, so yes. I want you to explain to to our listeners. Like, let's get down to the details and the gritty, literally, mm -hmm. because I watched you do this, and it is fascinating. So, how do you palpate a horse internally? Okay, so the um, the big thing about this is this is something any veterinarian learns to do in vet school. So it's not hocus pocus. It's not. Um, anything crazy mm. we all um, as as we learn how to be a large animal veterinarian we mm. all learned how to rectally put on a sleeve put some lube on our arms and put it in the rear end of a horse mm. um, and feel the internal uh, organs of the horse and that is also how we ultrasound is through the rectum so horses are far too large to get a good ultrasound through the abdomen of the uh, um for the uterus and the ovaries wouldn't be able to see them mm -hmm. unless we go in rectally so that's why we have to do certain things rectally in horses i've watched you do this with my horses you sedate them and you put them in sort of a similar it's what are those stocks called? a stock yeah and then then you tie up the tail and then that's when you set up your ultrasound and that's where you're basically then start but i noticed that today you first observe mm -hmm. what you see while you're looking at the horse from behind. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a, another big thing. Um, veterinary medicine, but also owners, osteopaths, anybody, you miss more by not looking than by not knowing. And mm -hmm. so just stop and look at the horse. Look at the symmetry or asymmetry. Look at the back end of the horse. Um, in a mare, for instance, you can tell a lot by how that uh, the vulva 
is in relation to the anus and the tail? Mm. Is it deviating to one side or the other? Is it being pulled in on one side or the other? Mm. And with your horse, that was one of the first indicators that there was something wrong. Yeah. Let's back up a bit because we're going to go. I'm so excited about diving deep into the details of this work. But I also want to kind of cover the broad, like the broad spectrum of what you're doing. So you typically book out six months in advance. Like this is a you have this booming business here where you have um, a ton of horses being brought to your facility here in southern Alberta. Can What do you why do you think that? You've cornered this market here and you're working in conjunction with a more holistic practice such as osteopathy. One, why do you think it's 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 clearly a need in you know within the community? And two, what are some of some common trends that you're seeing in the horses that you see every every day and every all throughout the year? It's not even a market to me because the whole mm. fascination for for me is um how I'm helping these animals. And so um, I'm doing this because I, I love what I do mm -hmm. and it is something that I'm truly passionate about because I've seen results. Um, I'm, I'm naturally a very skeptical and scientific person and this has just blown me away the, the results. So early on in working with Jess, um, uh, that, that was the time where at as a veterinarian i started getting um these cases that i have had owners um texting me calling me and saying i can't believe how different my horse is after you and jess did your treatment on mm -hmm. this horse or or corrected this adhesion or whatever it is that we did you know you always think oh well maybe it, it's the a fact that the owner thinks there was a, a result, mm -hmm. but there maybe wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was too extreme. It was horses that were afraid going into um, an arena for barrel racing that now are consistently going in mm. or um, horses that were bucking and now stop bucking completely. And they were bucking for years before. So very drastic differences. Um, and I think this is something that um, what I do is very unique. Um, there are a few other veterinarians that are doing it. They're scattered around in the world, I guess, and work with osteopaths. But it's it's very new to Canada, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure it won't be. It's, like I said, something that's not out of the scope of veterinary practice. Um, it's just a matter of understanding why this works and that we're missing that part of um, helping the horses. I think that that needs to be um, addressed and understood and then it won't, I won't be so booked up. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we'll put, Connie and I will put in the show notes for this episode, some places that our listeners, because our listeners are all over the place, mm -hmm. where they can one, find um, accredited osteopaths and also where they can find some veterinarians that are sort of working this holistic approach um, and maybe bringing in osteopathy into their practice. I want to kind of dive a little bit into that connection that you mentioned. So you're talking about horses that are bucking and then they stop bucking after they see you or they're not going into the arena, for example, and then they start going into the arena. And that to me reminds me of that connection that we have to behavior and pain. Mm -hmm. So clearly people that are coming to you are coming to you because they're seeing they're they're having behavioral issues and they're wondering whether they're pain related is that right that's right yeah things have changed a lot um for the longest time uh people asso associated poor behavior with the horse being bad mm. or being vindictive and i think we're putting a lot of um human emotional traits onto a horse that the horse doesn't have the horses are very simple they're very um they're very kind and pleasing animals and when they suddenly stop being that way then there is something wrong they they have not decided they didn't get up that morning and decide they hate their owner there's something wrong um, whether it's pain or whether it's fear those are the two things that horses um that prevent them from wanting to do well for they're human. And you mentioned something today which really blew my mind, which is that there are organs in the horse's body that 
are sort of access points for hormones that are connected to the fight or flight response. Yeah. So fear we see in horses that are is behavioral could also be like, for lack of a better word, medical. Mm hmm. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah. So it's, it's, this is delving more into the osteopathy part yeah. of it. And um, what I can say is that the kidneys are attached to the adrenal gland, which um, so it's a, a tiny little gland in front of the kidneys. And um, that is where your adrenaline hormone originates from. So if there is an issue, be it circulation, um, immobility, uh, fascial tension, things like that. Mm -hmm. If there's an issue in the horse um, that has to do with the kidneys or the adrenal gland or both, mm -hmm. um, because the two are attached together, then you can get uh, then you can get a very dramatic result in the horse, a very very dramatic fear result where suddenly they are afraid of certain things that they were not afraid of before, where um, a completely broke um, barrel horse, for instance, suddenly decides that it's extremely scared um, of going into a trailer or an uh, or an arena uh, for a race. Mm. So it, we have to we have to think outside the box, and that's what this whole thing is about: is um, those cases that are not cut and dry, and um, we've ruled out. Okay, there was not an injury. This horse is not um, limping around. It's not a, an overt lameness. Mm. Why is this horse suddenly so scared or said, is suddenly um, uh, bucking, for instance? Or acting out behaviorally, yeah, exactly. right? exactly. So instead of sending your horse to someone to fix your horse behaviorally, you know, I think it sounds like a lot of the work you're doing is explorative and based on, based on, on, on medically sound practices to then explore internally whether what's what is happening for that horse is something that's pain related or discomfort or even like immobility yeah because you talk about so a lot of your work is lameness related mm -hmm. so what are some of some common um sort of some common cases that come across your table yeah well um in the last several years since i've been delving into this area it's more a uh, very obscure asymmetry issues. So um, prior to this, it was much more cut and dry. Mm. I'd have a, a horse that's limping on the left front leg and mm. it had maybe caudal heel pain and maybe had navicular disease. So mm. nice and cut and dry. Now I'm delving into uh, into situations where um, the horse is off, like the horse is, feels uh, asymmetrical to the owner riding the horse, um, or it seems like it is... Um, it's it's suddenly not going into its left lead, for instance, and it always mm -hmm. did before. Uh, so more subtle things, and sometimes multi-leg lamenesses as well. So um, a primary lameness with a compensatory lameness and a secondary lameness. Mm -hmm. So a very complicated ones, um, and there there it becomes interesting because these horses that I see a lot of now are not injuries per se they are horses that are long-term um, asymmetrical they weren't like that to start but they've become that way over time and um, that's where we're delving deeper into okay why is this horse not moving symmetrically mm -hmm. and why is um, at this point now the say hip on the one side getting smaller uh, than the other side like there's even an asymmetry externally where the muscles are um, larger on one side than the other uh, and yet it's not per se a, um, a lameness not a not a something that is that specific that you can say okay well the hawk has arthritis it's okay. not like that so it sounds like, again, you're really encouraging owners to be observant Yes. about all of a sudden my horse isn't engaging on the, you know, the back right hind for some reason. And then you bring the vet out and they're like, well, there's not an obvious like acute lameness or impact lameness. Maybe there's, you know, there's something else going on. So you're really encouraging. It sounds like, I mean, certainly made me look at horses like my two horses differently is you sh you presented things in observation of my mare and my gelding that I didn't even see because I wasn't looking that hard I think mm -hmm. so it sounds like a lot of what you do is really about uh recognizing 
through observation what might be an irregularity in a horse all of a sudden or maybe slowly gradually over time and then that's when the osteopathy comes into play because I noticed that the way you work with Jessica is that she will do an examination of the horse look for specific and she's looking for how many signs that the horse should be put on the pelvic floor as you call it it's very important um, I think in my mind now, the way that we're doing these, these uh, exams, that the osteopathy portion is addressed. And so we're not just randomly sedating horses and um, doing rectal palpations and ultrasounds. We, um, in some situations, did in the beginning of our work years ago when Jess and I first uh, started working together. Mm. Um, and I found, okay, there's some horses I didn't find anything abnormal on internally. Mm -hmm. And to me, then we're not being efficient and we're doing, we're putting the horse under sedation for no reason. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure first that there are the osteopathic indicators and they have not been wrong. Um, I have complete faith in the two osteopaths that I work with now mm -hmm. because of the fact that I've worked with them that long and that much. And what are they looking for specifically? Immobility. So the fascia in the horse um, is from the head to the back end. Like there is fascia in the entire body all connected together. So mm -hmm. if you have some sort of an adhesion, some sort of a immobility or um, say an ovary is uh, displaced or even twisted, then there is a tension on that area. And uh, it, as as time goes on, that tension is going to continue to pull along the entire fascial plane of the horse. So you start off with a uh, an annoying tension, say of a ovary that's that is uh, flipped over backwards and yeah. on the right side, yeah. um, and that is annoying to the horse. It's kind of a it's maybe a little bit painful, but more just uh, if you can if you can. Um, Think of it as as something internally inside yourself. Yeah. If there's just a pull there in one certain spot, that's always there. And as time goes on, that horse moves differently because of that area, mm -hmm. and the um, the pull of the fascia in the body continues to um, to affect the horse uh, as uh, usually in the back, mm -hmm. and then it goes to the head to the pole, and you start seeing indicators of that. Um, internal restriction or tightness mm. all the way to the head as well. Yeah, and I notice that that's the first place that Jessica goes to. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited. We're going to have Jessica on the podcast to explain her side of this amazing field. You brought up the flipped ovary. So let's dive into a little bit of oh, my right. mare lady. Um, and I think it'll be really cool for our listeners to even hear like two really specific case studies, my gelding and my mare, um, and how you've helped them. So we brought Lady in to see you because she has shown um, immobility in her sacrum and in and she's also shown um, sensitivity, always often a lot of sensitivity in the side of her, like in her rib area. Um, she's also developing in like particular ways. And, and, and so it's like I just had a feeling after I had learned about some of the mares that you had helped. I was like, I have a really strong, I kind of had a gut feeling. I was like, I feel like she should see Connie. So let's talk a little bit about what we found in Lady. Absolutely. Yeah. So the first thing we noticed was um, just looking at her back end, mm -hmm. the vulva. Um, she had what's called a sunken anus, which a lot of older mares do. They lose fat around the anus and um, it gets pulled into the abdomen. And then the vulva, which is supposed to be sealed um, so that there's no uh, dirt, fecal matter, urine getting sucked into the vagina and mm -hmm. into the cervix and the uterus, um, that seal is, gets, gets to be fatigued and broken. Mm -hmm. But hers also was interesting because on the right side of the vulva, there was also a pull-in effect. So mm -hmm. the vulva was actually um, uh, slightly tilted to the right. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that we noticed is that her back was not great. Her top line wasn't wasn't great. She um, may be starting to sink a little bit of her, in her back. Yeah. Her abdominal muscle strength is poor. Mm -hmm. um, so you you start to think, well, maybe it's because um, she hasn't uh, been 
exercised a lot yeah. or maybe she's getting older. Yeah. But then on the other hand, there's a lot of older horses that uh, don't have a um, poor abdominal muscle tone or a sunken back. So yeah. it, that's uh, was my uh, um, go-to excuse prior to be thinking outside the box here. Um, and I would say that uh, that tells me the back being poor mm -hmm. is that there is um, an, something internally that's pulling. Mm. And horses can with, uh, withstand that for a while, but it doesn't feel good to have a back that is not strong. Mm -hmm. And um, over time, given months, years usually, um, horses just give up just like a person would. If mm -hmm. you have um, something really sore, you can fight it for a while, but then you just give in and give up. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what the back starts to do in a horse that has um, something that's pulling on it all the time. So in her case, then we went, we sedated her and very important for what I do is sedation, not only for the safety of myself and the horse, but also because I need um, the horse to be very still, very calm and relaxed to be able to feel specific structures internally. So I always start with ultrasound first. Mm -hmm. um, again, nothing magical. I've taken um, extensive courses in, in um, ultrasonography. And so I, I ultrasound the inner pelvis first, the lower, lower um, spine, so underneath the spine of the horse, mm -hmm. and then um, the SI joints internally. And so things that um, equine practitioners that are familiar with ultrasonography mm -hmm. can all do that. And that is something really important uh, in what we're doing because it's not going to maybe tell me what the primary issue is, but it's telling me what the after effects are. So in her case, um, we did find that there were um, uh, there was roughening on the L6 vertebrae. Yeah. And... Um, there, these these nodules of bone were actually protruding into the disc between the L6 and the S1 mm -hmm. vertebrae. And so something like that doesn't just happen um, for no reason whatsoever. Usually that's a traumatic incident. Um, and the other thing, so then we've, the, the other thing we found on her with her was her SI joints. Mm -hmm. Her right was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Her left was very um, thickened bony nodules, mm -hmm. abnormal. So again, why, right? Her confirmation's not bad, so I don't think it's confirmational. Mm -hmm. So then you start thinking, okay, this is probably an injury-related um, situation. Mm -hmm. And it's also cool because having sat next to you or stood next to you in this practice, I get to learn about a horse that I've only had for a year. So we've been, as we've been getting to know each other and she has a history that I don't know, it was actually really interesting that we found out she's had a foal. Right. Before. Yeah. So there's so much that owners, especially if they're they're owners that have maybe only had a horse for a year or a short period of time and they don't have a lot of history. Like I don't have a lot of history about Lady. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what we were able to learn just in observing her like internal body. Right. Yeah. When you say poor back and you're talking about um, what you're what you saw in Lady's confirmation, can you explain a little bit of that? Because you're because you're talking about poor ab abdominal um, strength. Yeah. And then a development, like an, I know that the way that her hind end is developed um, also maybe like, or the restriction that we saw in her sacrum area is also kind of an indicator of what you found internally. Yeah, exactly. So what we did find um, when we, we uh, con continued on with the ultrasound was mm -hmm. that we, we found that the left ovary was, was fine. It was in line with the left horn, so mm -hmm. side of the uterus. Mm -hmm. um, but on the right side, the right ovary was not in line at mm -hmm. all with mm -hmm. the right horn and was really quite tight. So um, I start with the ultrasound first just to get an idea of what all the structures look like. Mm. Um, and then after that, um, I, oh, I, there is also one other aspect of her is that the the uterus also was not normal mm -hmm. on her either yeah um and had fluid build up in the in the inside like the lumen or the um the hollow of the uterus and um mucus build up in it as well so um the the right the the right ovary 
um, once I took the ultrasound out and actually just felt mm -hmm. with my hand, so palpation, mm -hmm. is that it was flipped over and it was actually 270 degrees. So, wow. um, so not just half, but a little bit more um, because it ended up being in front of the horn, but it was underneath and in front. Yep. And so if, if we think about, I always like to think about, okay, how, why? like why and how can this happen mm. um and to me in her case it would have to be her sliding underneath herself and maybe um a, a jarring effect of falling onto a right hip yeah um because we have to look at what else is going on the uh, the left si joints or, um joint space the l6s1 with the bone uh nodules and then the right ovary as well so uh, I mean, we don't, we will never know for sure, but to me that makes sense is mm -hmm. something would have to have been quite traumatic for all three of those things to have occurred. And then you were able to bring yeah. the ovary back to its right position. Yeah. And again, that's something that, um, veterinarians are trained to do. We, we are trained to manual palp, manually palpate, um, move uteruses around, um, that that is one of the things that we we <laughs> so do cool. um and so as long as there's not restrictions or adhesions which is a different story mm -hmm. um an ovary can be brought back if um uh if it's done carefully and correctly mm -hmm. back to its normal position mm -hmm. um this particular ovary was not normal either so right and yeah. so and now i want to explain so for our, everyone who's listening when I like, so this is something that we've been working on with lady in physio was feeling a restriction in the, in the sacrum and in the pelvis, and then also having that immobility on the right side. Mm -hmm. So having a lot more mobility and a lot more flexion on the left, but having a harder time on the right. And so that would align with your findings, which is if she had a backwards flipped ovary, you explained that that will affect all the ligaments that exist and will also affect the pelvis. Yeah, exactly. And eventually what ends up happening is the horse moves um, asymmetrically just because there there's a tension or tightness on one side versus the other. And so they start to move their hind leg on that side differently as well. Um, maybe not, their stride length is not as, um, as far on that side as the other side. Mm -hmm. And in time, and I'm talking like month, months to years again, you start to get where of certain structures, so joints in particular. So I'm not saying by any means that all arthritis in horses is caused by a flipped ovary or yeah. something internal, but um, I'm saying that if there is something internal, it can lead to other external musculoskeletal well, issues. Well, and guys, we injected her right hawk. Yeah. Before we went on this trip. Yeah. Because she had shown to have, you know, mild to moderate arthritis in the right hawk. So isn't that interesting? Yeah. The kind and of connection. That's what what fascinates me about this. Not all of the horses that I see um, are uh, amazingly cut and dry, but I would say a huge majority are. Mm. Um, once I see the whole picture and we put the whole picture together and I often, um, I don't get the information from the owners ahead of time of everything that's been done. Mm. Um, maybe just a short little version of what all has been done. But as I'm doing my exam and finding the findings, oftentimes the owners will come forward then and say, oh my goodness, um, yeah, mm. I've gone here and here and here and we've injected this and this and um, this is how long this has been going on. And so that in the end, the the full picture is always fascinating to me because more often than not, um, what I find completely lines up with what has been happening happening with the horse. Well, and for so many of us, we get horses that we we maybe have a little bit of their history, or maybe we have none of their history, or maybe they're older, right? And so something that I think I've I've so far that I've learned in 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 watching you work is that there could have been some things taking place internally that then, and as you you said today, like they make their way down to the lower joints. Mm -hmm. So if there's an asymmetry, which is caused by something internal, then it will, if it's not addressed over years and time, and that asymmetry continues and continues over years, then it will eventually make its way down to the stifles, to the hawk, to 
the way that the horse even maybe like I would imagine maybe even the way that they're tracking and then therefore the way they're wearing their feet like it could it could it ends up becoming a whole horse situation yeah and interestingly it does move to the front end as well so this is not all just hind end Mm. um the front the front end can start having um issues with the front feet even just because of the compensatory factor from the hind end remember the first time you found that feeling of deep connection with your horse That moment when you knew that this was more than just a sport, more than just a hobby. It was a partnership. It was a way of life. But then things got complicated. Maybe it started with conflicting advice from trainers or your own frustration of not making progress at the pace that you wanted. Or maybe you even started feeling afraid of your horse's behavior. Suddenly, that magic feeling, that deep connection, that started to slip away. I've been in your shoes, and I know that feeling. That is why I created NF+. I want every horse and rider to experience that profound connection that starts with education and a strong support system. At NF+, we are breaking down barriers, bringing you the best training, the most helpful advice, and a community that supports you at every step of your journey. With audio and video lessons on everything from horse care to groundwork to rider psychology, NF Plus is your key to unlocking the true potential of your partnership. It's not just about looking good in the saddle or winning ribbons. It's about rediscovering why you fell in love with horses in the first place. It's about becoming a better horse person, becoming someone who has the tools to achieve the goals and find that feel that all horsemen and horsewomen aspire to have. Whether you're an experienced competitor or just starting out, we have designed NF Plus specifically to support you. Join Noel Floyd Plus today and become part of a movement that puts your relationship with your horse at the heart of everything. Because when you ride with understanding and connection, the possibilities are literally endless. Sign up today at noelfloydplus.com. That's noelfloydplus.com. Now, something you found in Lady that you also found in my gelding, which we'll, we should dive into, which we talked a little bit about, was the kidney immobility. Mm-hmm. So can you talk a little bit about kidney immobility? Yeah. So when we ultrasound horses, um, we can ultrasound the, the left kidney easily because it's further back in horses. Um, but it shouldn't be so far back in a large horse, um, like your gelding, for instance, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where I can ultrasound the whole structure. Yeah. Um, and also every organ in the body, including the kidney, um, is suspended. The kidney is a little different because it is not um, specifically inside the abdomen. It's extra peritoneal, it's called, mm-hmm. but it's still mobile. You can push on it and it moves. Okay. Um, when fascial attachments are very tight, for whatever reason, you start to get immobile structures. And, mm. um, and this is something that uh, I, palpating horses over and over every day for a long time, um, I, got, I get to uh, realize or learn what's normal and what's norm- not normal. Yeah. So it's a bit of a feel thing, but um, when a structure is, is very pulled backwards, um, there's got to be a fascial pull. There's not any other reason why a kidney, for instance, should be f- too far back or further back than it naturally should be. Mm. Um, and it shouldn't be immobile either. And so when you have that, then, um, you can have back pain is huge because the kidneys are right underneath the spine. Mm. Um, and also you can have Um, issues with hormones and that is more the scope of osteopathy Mm -hmm. but I can tell you that the kidneys are attached to the adrenal gland and that is the adrenaline hormone organ Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can get issues that way as well with the immobility Um, and the reason I've uh, and the reason I that I say that is more secondarily from the feedback that I have from uh, from owners for years and years now mm-hmm. is that these horses that have immobile kidneys where we do a series of stretching um, movements to try and mobilize this organ mm-hmm. and the horse goes home and then becomes a different horse permanently because they're not scared anymore or 
uh, you know, not bucking anymore, things like that. Mm -hmm. That's been incredible to me. And I heard an old cowboy say that poorly fitted saddles can be so damaging internally to horses because they can sit if they if they if they sit wrong they sit right on the kidney mm -hmm. is that right yeah so um there there's of course other structures in between there mm -hmm. but yeah you can get pressure onto certain is uh, uh, certain portions of organs from poorly fitted, fitted saddles and that causes pain it's just like if we have very poorly fitted shoes for instance mm. on our feet um, over time, you're going to get bruising. And it's the same thing with a horse. So what are some reasons why a kidney would be immobile? Um, I think the only reason would be a fascial pull. Okay. So again, back to everything is connected by fascia in our bodies. And if we have a tightness on one section of our body, there's going to be a fascial pull. And so in Lady's case, her kidney was being, it was immobile because she was because of a fascial pull but why was the fascial pull taking place the fascial pull is going to be from the fact that this ovary was flipped backwards so if you have something that's flipped backwards yeah um the ligaments of that ovary are yeah. tight yeah and it's going to manifest itself throughout the entire body and this is what's so fascinating to me is yeah. how much how much of the body within a horse and both inside and outside is so interconnected. So really, like to me, showcasing how important it is that we, one thing is not, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to be like reductive in that it's like, oh, it, you know, they often, one issue can then connect to another issue then can manifest some, with something down the line. And that's why it's so in, important that we're looking at like the, like the bigger picture. Absolutely, that's, that, you can't have said it better. <laughs> there, that is exactly how this entire um, career that I've now made for myself on um, trying to hold, ha help the horse as a whole horse. Mm. That's that's exactly what my feeling is: is that we have issues that are primary. We have to find what that primary issue is, mm -hmm. and um, that primary issue, if it's been there for years, is going to have a whole bunch of secondary and cursory issues um, that we're going to have to also address. But we have to find that primary issue. And I just want to tell everyone who's listening, like something that I found really empowering on all of this is that, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I just want to know everything that there is to know about my horses. Like I just want to lean on all the modalities that we have available to us to understand exactly because my horses can't our horses can't tell us how they feel but they can certainly behave in certain ways and they can try and I think they do genuinely try to communicate to us like no uh, like no I don't feel capable of doing that or ow that hurts and therefore I'm going to like avoid that because that action or that movement or walking into a trailer or you know doing certain things might hurt and so it's really helpful and I don't know you know about anybody else but for me when my horses behave a certain way, sometimes, you know, you feel, I don't know, you feel frustrated or confused or, you know, and, and all I've found to be helpful in, in navigating the, the sort of the, the, it feels like the black hole of possibilities with horses is to lean on so many different practitioners that come at it from a different point of view. But you, when you do that, you learn so much. Like I've learned so much from physiotherapists, from from yourself, from osteopathy, from cranial sacral, from getting her x-rayed from, you know, it's it's unbelievable um, how when you when you explore the whole horse, how much you learn about how your horse exists in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so, too. And if that can be the take home message is is for owners to realize that their horses are trying to tell them something mm -hmm. um, and they cannot and just take a step back like don't get angry right immediately if your horse is not doing this or that yeah. um, don't make it worse by starting to beat your horse up or yeah. have someone else do it for you yeah. just take a step back and think okay is this something new and why is the horse doing this suddenly um, or why is this behavior becoming the norm over the last several months? Mm -hmm. um, 
we just need to be able to open our eyes and our minds um, and start figuring out, okay, what's the underlying issue? I also want to say too, because when I list all those people, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of re listeners that are going to be like, yeah, cool. That all sounds quite expensive. But I want you guys to know, like the treatment I had with Connie and Jessica is cost less than a round of injections. Mm -hmm. It's a more for it's in, you know, to me, I was quite shocked and and um, by it's how reasonable it was. And it was it costs less than my health papers to cross the border. It costs less than my injection, the injections that I had done on lady about of injections. So this some of the stuff actually might not be as financially um, uh, challenging or as like, uh, you know, what's the word that I'm looking for? Like it's, it's, it might not be, it might be more affordable than you think, or it might be, so it might actually save you money in the long run because you might, your horse might have an internal restriction that might actually mean that they don't have to get injections, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that sounds like, um, it's a worthwhile pursuit, you know? Right. So let's talk a little bit about gelding scarring mm -hmm. because I didn't even know this was a thing. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I didn't know that it was a thing either when I became a vet. Um, this is something that um, over the last, I would say, mm, five to 10 years has become um, a much broader subject. And um, we have castrated horses for many, many years, mm -hmm. um, centuries. Yep. And um, there are a lot of different ways that the horses have been castrated. and there there is one thing um that is different from a castrating a horse versus castrating say um a bovine is mm. that these horses are we're asking them to perform and be our assistants in our our uh, our jobs like ranch athletic horse, endeavors performance everything yep. like that for the next 25 years right um and so the castration procedure um, is very important. Mm. It's not just about removing testicles, it's how you do it. Um, and when you have the testicular cords that are cut too short, they are they, they bleed, they will bleed. Um, and when you let them go back into the abdomen and they, re and they release a bunch of blood, in the entrance of the abdomen, what does that blood do? It's going to clot and it's going to create scar tissue. Wow. So that that's all factual. There's nothing voodoo about that. Um, it's it's just it's just a, a fact basically. Um, it's just like when when horses are say um, they they have their ovaries removed, so that's spayed for a mare. Mm -hmm and you make an incision through the body wall, you're mm -hmm. going to create scar tissue. So whatever you do with a horse, um, whether they do it to themselves by, uh, by an injury mm -hmm. or whether we do it as a surgery, we want to avoid scar tissue because that's adhesions, that's restrictions, and then we're all back to this fascial pull again. And to, to really clarify that, so the scar tissues are, the scar tissue becomes a problem because it affects the fascia and mm -hmm. the fascia then can affect and we just talked about how fascia is like this blanket all throughout a horse's body covering organs and interconnecting between um, um, ligaments and muscles so scar tissue in one part of the body if bad enough can affect a whole other part of the body yeah exactly um and that is the basis of osteopathy, um, going to osteopathy conferences and uh, especially listening to the, the um, uh, educators for osteopaths. There are the, the fascial um, planes of horses are all mapped. And this is anatomy. Mm. Veterinarians learn anatomy as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we all know that the, the entire body is connected like mm -hmm. i mean that's why we're a solid being um so there is fascia from one end to the other mm -hmm. and if you have a scar tissue um especially in the uh, so in a gelding for instance the the area where there it is a problem um is inside the canal where the cord used to run but then also at the um entrance of the body wall into the abdomen mm. and that is also muscle 
and it's supposed to be able to do things. It's supposed to be able to move um, in certain ways. That's what it me- it's meant to be. Um, but if there's a if there's a big scar tissue blob there, um, and it's not on the other side, for instance, right. like say if you only have a, a, a scar tissue uh, adhesion on one side and not the other side, then you're going to create asymmetry. And I don't think anybody could argue that you know that that is that's a fact um there there are uh it's it's going to feel different from that in that area versus the other side and so then when you have scar tissue there the closest structures um are the lumbar spine because that abdominal wall is attached up high to the lumbar spine Mm -hmm. so um you can get a downward pull of the lumbar spine Mm -hmm. which chronically can cause back pain Mm -hmm. and the other thing is that uh, adjacent stifle and Mm. so if there's scar tissue restrictions there that stifle is not going to be able to extend backwards as easily as as good as the other side Um, interesting so then we're back to okay we have this primary issue and then all these secondary things happen over time well and so many of us if you have a gelding like you don't have any control over how that horse was gelded. Or you may not even know how that horse was gelded. There's so many different ways. Um, and now uh, in the veterinary um, schools, the ways are being taught very well. Mm. Um, the So doing castrations in a very controlled manner under anesthetic on the horse's back, mm-hmm. freezing the cord so the horse um, can't feel anything even under anesthetic. So there's no pullback effect of the of what's called cream master muscle. You can get the cords out long. Um, mm-hmm. You can keep them clamped long enough that there's no bleeding. There's so many things we can do to try and avoid that whole problem of this bleeding cord. Um, that is being it's being addressed now um but unfortunately there's a lot of horses that you know prior to that that did not get castrated that way Mm -hmm. or a lot of horses that still get castrated without anesthetic yeah and that's a whole other topic that's another whole topic yeah now you told me is it one in three geldings have scarring from being that, gelded this is something that actually the, the in osteopathy that mm-hmm. is their prediction okay yeah and is there any there is there any statistics out there from a veterinary science point of view no about no this is so new i mm-hmm. would say that yeah. this is something that um needs a lot more research mm-hmm. and um needs to be looked at a lot further i from my point of view now that i have been working with osteopaths mm-hmm. um I do see it, but I see all the problem issues, right? Mm. So how many are actually not Statistically issues? evident, yeah. It's hard for me to say. Of to course. me, it feels like, oh my goodness, every gelding has a gelding scar. But it's just because I see um, the problem ones. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about what you found in my gelding, mm-hmm. Gigi. We call him Gigi. Um, he had, so why don't we dive in a little bit to the mm-hmm. specifics of what we saw? Because to give you guys, to give the listeners a little bit of an idea. So Galano is a, is a new gelding to me. He's again, I've only had him like a couple months and um, two months. And he showed a lot of um, just like a weakness behind. And um, when I had him looked at by my physiotherapist, we saw a lot of, um, a lot of restriction and stiff, like stickiness in the ribs. And then we saw um, just like what I found to be like not a lot of strength and not a lot of mobility um, in that lumbar area. And so it's interesting. So why don't you share a little bit with what you found in Gigi? Mm -hmm. So um, same thing as your mare. We start off the same way with the ultrasound of the pelvis. Mm -hmm. Um, And his L6 vertebrae had a pull down effect so the the l6s1 should be lined up mm-hmm. um and if it's not i mean there can be other reasons injury wise why an l6 and s1 and the disc space aren't normal mm-hmm. but there was just a generalized pull down effect of the l6 and then uh, with ultrasound um i can uh, go down the body wall mm-hmm. and look at the muscle and look at specifically the um entrance or exits points of the where this the testicular cord used to run prior mm-hmm. to him being gelded mm-hmm. um and on ultrasound is great because 
it is um, an excellent modality for soft tissue. So uh, you can see dense tissue versus muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. And there was a huge difference between the left side and the right side on him in terms of the, um, the internal uh, inguinal rings, which is the, the big word for where the cords used to go through uh, into the abdomen. Um, so the left side was very dense and had a, kind of a haphazard um, fiber pattern to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the right side also had a little bit, but not nearly like the left side did. And in terms of um, what one can do about that, it is scar tissue. Mm -hmm. Scar tissue is never going to go away. Mm -hmm. um, so the only thing that you can do is you can try to stretch the sides of the the um, muscle where that cord used to run through. Mm -hmm. And the way I find doing that the easiest is to um, concurrently stretch the, the like manually with my hands um, through the bottom part where the, where the cord used to run through um, from the scrotum upward into the abdomen mm -hmm. and then inward, downward, and just um, put steady pressure on that tissue and start to stretch it. Um, and I saw often, you do this. Mm -hmm. You had one hand inside and one hand outside, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and, and some of them over the years, they have so much scar tissue, and I can see that on the ultrasound. It's so thick and so advanced that um, there's not much. I mean, I can do a little bit more from the uh, external ring than the internal ring. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing um, as I went on with, with these cases is that we also, after we see the horses, uh, the osteopath and I, we come up with a rehab plan. Mm -hmm. And that is the second phase of trying to heal these horses. So I start it. Um, internally, I have the osteopath, um, address the external restrictions after that. Mm -hmm. And then the owner is the third part of that, um, team. Yeah. Because that's where the horse needs to relearn how to move symmetrically. Um, and we design stretching exercises in, tor um, in order for that horse to actually stretch those adhesions further than what I have started. Mm -hmm. And that's really the, um, the, the last part of that, that whole, uh, plan is to get this force to, to, um, not feel so restricted in one spot versus the other and yeah. to move, move symmetrically. Um, so the, the other thing then you, you I say weakness in the back or mm -hmm. back pain, mm -hmm. If the if a lumbar spine is getting pulled down constantly because of a scar, mm -hmm. of course they're going to have pain, right? Yeah. Um, the uh, there's a whole different um set of issues that can happen in this in horses where, say, kissing spines, for instance, where there is a uh, the spine's processes are overriding. Mm. That can be um created. It, there are definitely horses out there that are um, that is that this was something they were born with, but there's a lot of horses out there where this was something that um, has happened over time due to an internal pain or a back pain. Um, and once you address those issues internally, those restrictions, um, and then re-X-ray the horse, those spinous processes are actually not overriding anymore. Wow, this is something that. Um, we spend a lot of time uh, with with horse owners that have had horses that, like over years, have had back pain, and um, I do X-ray backs as well in in some of those cases, and um, those those horses do improve significantly once we've done that and once the rehab exercises have been done. So that's wow. just kind of an aside. That wasn't what's going on with your horse, but no. just to, yeah. But I mean, kissing spine feels like it's. Something I feel like I hear more and more of horses that have kissing spine. Yeah, and there are Facebook groups, and there are like so much literature out there of how horse owners can navigate when their horses are diagnosed with kissing spine. And you can tell the emotion behind, you know, when you get that diagnosis, people think that their horses like career is over. They can't ride. How are they going to ride? Are they going to be limited to that? So it sounds like, you know, there are other solutions or there are other pursuits 
that's really, I feel like that's hopeful for people who might have had a kissing spine diagnosis for their horse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If someone is maybe thinking they're listening to this podcast and they're like, maybe what if my gelding has some scarring? What are some of the things that they can look for? So first things first, um, find a certified osteopath um, that is someone that has the four-year osteopathy degree Mm -hmm. um, and have them evaluate the horse. So there are external indicators for internal restrictions. um, And sometimes it requires two exams Mm -hmm. because sometimes some of these horses are not, they're maybe younger. Um, And so the osteopath can mobilize the, say, vertebrae Mm -hmm. that are immobile, Mm -hmm. but then they go back four weeks later and lo and behold, the same segment or section of vertebrae are immobile again. And Mm -hmm. so that's actually one of the signs for internal restrictions. Um, And then if that's the case, that osteopath will... uh, will recommend okay this horse this is this is beyond my scope Mm -hmm. this horse should be examined by a veterinarian and looking for scar tissue in particular and you mentioned to me that um scarring like gelding scarring can affect the circulation in the lower limbs Mm -hmm. of a horse and especially in the in the the hind end of a horse yeah so if there's a weakness or a poor development or an inability for development that could be connected to circulation which could be connected to scal- to scarring from being gelded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any kind of a scar tissue, um, it does. It can affect uh, circulation. We've seen all sorts of different things. Um, horses that have chronically swollen sheaths, where they keep cleaning the sheath and mm. thinking, okay, they keep getting infections in the sheath, and um, but yet the the sheath keeps being swollen, and that was another kind of aha moment to me is that um, these horses. Once I have stretched that tissue and they went through the rehab program of these restrictions being loosened, mm. lo and behold, the um, swollen sheath was no longer there. So just things that I have observed over a very long time of being a veterinarian um, and now getting to see, okay, there are other things going on in these horses that um, I have not honestly addressed um, as a veterinarian. I have addressed it, but I don't think I've addressed the primary issue, right? Mm. And so then once I've um, addressed the primary issue, these secondary effects have resolved themselves. So interesting because I feel like there's more conversation about top lines, for example. Mm -hmm. And I'd love for us to even touch a little bit on top lines because top line can be a bit of, like it's a big topic, right? We had lots of, we've even had, you know, body workers taking photographs of horses at high performance competitions with like um, atrophied backs, right? And so there's a lot of conversation about top lines and everyone wants their horses to have a wonderful top line and they're trying and there's, you know, we're conscious of what our horses, how our horses back look, how our neck, how are they developing? Um, So it's from what I've, you know, learned in having both my horses looked at and treated um, and healed by you and, or at least I should say, I should say you've you've maybe wiped some of the slate, right? And then it's the onus is on me to do the physiotherapy and to follow the the routine that is or the the program that's going to allow us to maybe build a a more correct foundation. But I'd love to talk a little bit about top lines just because I feel like that might also be a little bit of an indicator of some things that are happening internally, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if there are internal issues, then you can do all the abdominal stretching, back stretching exercises that you want with that horse, but you're not going to build a proper top line. So a proper top line, if you have a um, a pull down effect from fascia, or if you have poor circulation going to the muscles of the back, um, you, you are not going to gain in what you're trying to accomplish. Um, there are horses, and this is not all horses, this is actually a rare thing, but um, they have verminous arteritis, for instance. So mm. this is something that's not a new thing. There is a uh, the roundworm called Strongylus vulgaris, mm. and with um, what's thought to be immune suppression or chronic pain, that the larva of that worm can actually bury through the intestinal wall mm-hmm. into the blood vessels, and they lodge um, in the... Uh, anterior mesenteric root, which is a branch off the big aorta 
artery that runs under the back. Um, and they, the larva, they, they do affect those arteries in that they thicken the walls, mm. the circulation becomes affected. Um, you can see uh, clots in those tiny little vessels at times, um, just poor circulation or a lot of scar tissue in that area. And again, this is not voodoo. This is something that you can see on ultrasound. Um, and there are, there finally now, um, I mean, I learned about in the vet school, I graduated in 1995. We learned that back then. Yeah. Um, I, there has been uh, an article now in the Canadian Vet Journal about verminous arteritis again mm -hmm. so it's something that's that exists and definitely not to the extent of the whole bloodworm era prior to proper deworming okay. but this has very little to do with deworming per se because um it's now it's now become more of an immune issue with the horses mm -hmm. um maybe dewormer resistance but mm -hmm. also horses that are immune suppressed and they um they do not uh do they do not clear worms like they should out of their body. Mm -hmm. A lot of adult horses do not have worms because their immune systems can very easily um, maintain, maintain their worm burden very low. Right. So um, if a horse has verminous arteritis, those vessels become affected. And um, I find horses that have this issue they the first thing i see is the top line starts to deteriorate mm. over time you see other indicators like a poor doing horse a coat doesn't look good just ill thrifty but that's way down the line um the first signs can be back pain or poor top line mm. so if you have a horse that has that and i'm not saying all horses with poor top lines have verminous arteritis by yeah. any means but if you have verminous arteritis you can have a poor top line and back pain. And until you address that um, properly, um, and that's something you can discuss with your veterinarians, yeah. and they can check that with ultrasound, um, then until that's, that's addressed, mm -hmm. you're not going to gain with your top line. And you guys should know, like my gelding had these, I'm going to call them blood worms because I can't pronounce. How do I say it? Verminous? <laughs> Verminous arteritis. arteritis. Yeah. So we found that he had that. Yeah. And, you know, you guys should know, like, he was, he's had a single owner before me and he was, um, he was bred. He had a, he came from a really, you know, uh, well-respected Andalusian breeding program. Um, so these things can happen because immune suppression can happen from stress. Mm -hmm. Right. So some of, you know, you might think, oh, I, like I didn't I didn't think that he would have that, but he did. And we treated him. And um, and you can see that from he's, you know, had uh, classical and competitive dressage training before he came to me. And I wonder whether some of his challenges in developing muscle in his back end has been because he's had bloodworms and who knows how long he's had that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's just another tool of exploring are our horses optimized yeah. are our horses being given the best chance to do all the things that they want to do or they they are willing to do with us but are they somehow physiologically or um, internally restricted and there's just no way for them to tell us unless we kind of get in there and you really get in there I've seen you mm -hmm. you know it's but it's it's so amazing that this work is available to us yeah yeah, and I think it's important to um, find out what it is that the horse has a problem with. If you mm -hmm. start to just haphazardly um, deworm with all sorts of things or throw everything at the horse, um, number one, if you do too many things at once, you have no idea what worked, if something did work. Right. Um, and number two, you don't know what the primary problem was. Um, so I think it's really important to delve into what the primary issue is. Mm. And um, these, again, these are horses that are very obscure, very um, maybe mild asymmetries or lamenesses or um, behavioral issues, mm -hmm. um, pain in the backs, things like that. They're, they're not going to be your uh, profuse lamenesses that are um head nodding lame sort of thing right mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that that is that that might be a, a far down the road progression to what we're talking about but um that is more um a specific lameness or um maybe an injury or something like that
Well, and Galano, Gigi is 10 years old. So if we hadn't been able to diagnose him now, like what if he had gone for years, you know, and you're doing all the things, but you haven't diagnosed that he has blood worms, then, you know, come 17, 18, 19 years old, you might start to see that effect of that. Um, Cause I saw it in the ultrasound, like mm-hmm. the, the, like there's a thickening, it's like a sludgy, you know, this, you can see that the, the flow of blood is not as optimized mm-hmm. um, as it would be, you know, in other parts of the body. And you showed me the difference. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, imagine what it would be like for him if he hadn't been diagnosed and then he goes eight years down the line and then he starts, you know, he's really starts to lose muscle and he really starts to weaken. But that's because he's had compromised circulation throughout his body for um for such a, for like for the majority of his life yeah exactly yeah and in the past these would be horses that we retire mm-hmm. um and maybe retire think, early retire early yep. think maybe well they've aged early um or they must have had arthritis in their back or this or that um but now just uh thinking outside of the box and looking for things that's the big um i think take home is you just got to look look for things, um, look at what the problem is first, yeah. and then think, okay, what in this area, if this horse has a top line that's poor, and this owner is doing all the right things to try and correct that, why is that not working? Hmm. So it's, it just start looking for reasons, and some of those reasons are not going to be external on an x-ray. Some of those reasons may very well be internal. As we like wrap up our podcast, I'd love to dive a little bit into the rapid fire questions, which are actually my favorite. And I've modified, you're going to get the first modified version of the rapid fire questions because I want to focus them on horse health. The first question is, and just answer the first thing that comes to mind. If you could read one book to the horse world, what would it be? So um, I would say the most important um, book for horse owners would be training principles Mm. for like a Monty Roberts kind of a training um, principle Mm -hmm. because there it's it is um the what what's addressed is that you're training this horse based on um the kindness of the horse Mm. and what the horse will give back to you Mm -hmm. so rather than um rather than trying to get a horse to force a horse to um, conform to what you want yeah step back and start reading the horse language mm. itself so sounds if like there is something a, observational like exactly so mm. if there was a book of that yeah then i would say um start start observing the horse's uh actions at the horse's um movements start looking start looking Cool. And um, then you will open your mind and learn. It's interesting that you say that because we don't have a book coming out, but we actually on NF Plus, Tick Mainer is coming out with a masterclass that breaks down observation, motivation, um, communication and play. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a book, guys, yeah. but Tick is coming out with us um, and he, he dedicates a whole course on observing horses. Mm-hmm. And I do agree with you that I think it's, you know, if some of us went through pony club or some of us started riding at our local um, riding school, you know, you jump right on the horse. You're not actually even looking at, I mean, you're looking at part of the horse when you're on, on a horse's back, Mm -hmm. but very, very few, like, I think it's changing, but a lot of us do not have a foundation in observation. Yeah. Right. And it's common sense too. It's Mm -hmm. not something that you need to necessarily as a horse owner, take um, a bunch of, veterinary courses to do yeah. is your observation um, and your ability to connect with your horse. Yeah. And once you've done that, you can notice subtle differences in that horse, be it um, like grooming. Grooming is a huge thing. Mm-hmm. Um, if if horse owners groom their horses a lot, mm-hmm. they will notice certain things. I'm always excited when somebody says, Oh, I, my horse, I've noticed a small lump and it's like tiny. It's like a pea sized lump. Yeah. Well, now I know that this person has actually spent time grooming that horse to know that suddenly this lump came up. So it's the same thing as, as um, observing your horse, how that horse moves or the personality of the horse. Is it changing? Okay. So observation. I love that. That's yeah. such a powerful takeaway. 
Who do you think is the most iconic horse in history, in your opinion? Mm -hmm. um, I have to say Big Ben. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Ian will really appreciate that. Yeah. Most undervalued skill as a horse owner. I think we're back to observation. Amazing. I, I really do. I love that as a takeaway. Who is the greatest horse practitioner or horse health mind you think in history? Not necessarily a horse practitioner. It was a large animal practitioner. Yeah. Um, and his name was Dr. Otto Radistitz. And he is who I coined that term you miss um, more by not looking than by not knowing. I love that. Yeah. I love that statement. And you know what? Why I love these questions is because we get to find people from the ether, like mm -hmm. from, you know, the horse world is filled with amazing minds. And I find sometimes it can be overwhelming with all the amazing horse minds out there that have something to offer us. And so it's really interesting to hear. So can you say his name again? And Dr. Otto Radistitz. Radistitz. And he was the, um, we, uh, he was actually a professor of veterinary medicine when I went through vet school. So I was fortunate, fortunate enough to know him and, um, and learn from him. But he was the, we always called him the god of veterinary medicine because he wrote the textbook veterinary medicine. Um, oh, really? Yeah. He was, he was an amazing mind um, and uh, for large animals. And so that includes cattle, but cattle and horses. And yeah, um, and yeah he was just drilled that into us. You need to look, you need to look, um, and then you will find, and then you will learn in that order. Wow. Last question. Mares, stallions, or geldings? Mares. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Oh, gosh. You, there is nothing better than a quirky bay mare. They're, they're just, that's my favorite. Um, the, the little bay mares, um, they seem to all be the same. They got their own little personalities. And I love mares. I think I'm biased because I'm a repro vet, yeah. but um, yeah, they they've got they've got the personality to go with their attitude. And <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love that answer. Well, thank you so much for coming on the Deer Horse World podcast. I learned so much from you, and I'm so I'm I'm just so stoked that we had this conversation. Well, thank you very much as well for inviting me. Nice one. All right, dude. So good. We navigate.